Đây. And you are welcome to begin. We have Abigail Kim, Emily Kylie, Scott Papanyak. Whenever you are ready, please feel free. The, the floor is yours and we are thrilled to have you. Hey, thank you so much. And it's so great to be um, with all of you today at the Carroll School. Uh, I know we're not in person, but I think actually in some instances, this is working quite well for, for many of you because you don't have to uh, leave your office. You can just um, sit, sit right in the comfort of your home or, or if you are back at work. So um, happy to be with you today. Um, my name is Emily Kiley. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management um, here at St. Joseph Prep. Um, and I'm joined today by my Assistant Director of Enrollment Management, Abby Kim, and our Assistant Head of School for Academics, Scott Papanyak. So we will spend the next bit with you um, going through some information. I did just want to mention before we kick things off a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I did see that many of you are RSVP'd for our um, or many at the Carroll School are RSVP'd for our Sunday open house this weekend from one to four o'clock. Um, but if not, please feel free um, to check out our website or maybe Abby can even pop that RSVP in the chat. Um, and also Abby did just add into the chat um, a way for you to kind of check in with us today and, and become an inquiry with St. Joseph Prep if you haven't already done so. So I, I, she has added that link into the chat as well. So that said, I think I am going to hand things over to Abby and she's gonna walk us through a few slides and, and then you'll hear um, from Scott and um, myself again. So take it away, Abby. Awesome, thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Abigail Kim and I'm the Assistant Director of Enrollment Management here at St. Joseph Prep. Um, this information session will probably last for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, it's designed to just give you a broad overview of St. Joseph Prep, um, about our educational model, about our community, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions as well. So if you think of any questions that you have as we go along, feel free to put those in the chat um, or save those for the end and we'll be able to answer those too. Um, so just a couple of fast facts about St. Joseph Prep. So we are located in the Alston Brighton neighborhood of Boston. We're very accessible via public transportation. I'm just gonna let someone in now, okay. Um, very accessible via public transportation, including the commuter rail, the T and multiple bus lines as well. Um, SJP is an intentionally small community comprised of about 250 students in grades nine through 12. So we average about 50 to 60 students per grade level. And this really allows us to provide a tight knit, um, sorry, sorry, more people are trickling in. Um, this allows us to provide our students with small classes and small advisory groups as well. And I'll talk a little bit about our advisory program later on. Um, but St. Joseph Prep is a really tight knit community where students form strong bonds with their teachers as well as their classmates too. Our average class size is about 18 students and our average advisory size is about 10 students. Um, and our advisory program, which I mentioned before, assigns every student a faculty or staff advisor. I'm actually an advisor to a group of nine juniors. And so through that advisory program, you're meeting with your advisor every single day for 30 minutes. Um, this really allows time to check in with the entire group um, it also allows for one-on-one -on -one academic coaching with students. And your advisor is really there to keep students accountable um, and make, make sure that they're staying on track um, with their grades. St. Joseph Prep is a college preparatory high school. So what does that mean? Um, it means we have a rigorous college prep curriculum with college prep courses, honors level courses, and AP courses as well. Last year, 100% of our graduates were accepted to a four-year college or university. And in past years, it's been you know, around that 98, 99%. So um, next, we'll be talking about our educational model a little bit. So the St. Joseph Prep education is defined by four key pillars, which are academic excellence, authentic community, meaningful engagement, and dynamic innovation. 
So now I'll dive a little bit deeper into each one of those pillars. So the first is academic excellence. Our small community really allows for individualized attention in the classroom. We also have a variety of academic supports that are available to students to help meet the high academic standards here. And later on in the presentation, Scott will talk a lot more about the specific support services that we have for students. We also offer 13 AP courses, honors courses, as I mentioned before, and we require all students to take an SAT and ACT prep course in their junior year, which is great because a lot of you know, families might choose to pay for SAT or ACT prep classes, which are really expensive, but we offer that as a part of our curriculum here. So really helping to prepare students for college and for the college application process as well. Another really um, important thing to mention about our curriculum is that St. Joseph Prep has a STEAM curriculum. So STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. And this STEAM curriculum is mandatory for the first two years. So in a student's freshman year, they'll choose from an art class, a graphic design class, or a, I believe it's a CAD, which is computer-aided design course that students can choose in their first year. And then in their sophomore year, all students will take a STEAM class. And in this STEAM class, um, there's lots of different elements. So they're creating like smartphone apps, they're working with robotics, working with- Somebody's calling printers. you or something. Your phone is vibrating or? Yeah. Um, working with 3D printers, things like that. Um, and with the support of our, our STEAM advisor. So lots of opportunities to um, participate in all, all types of classes at, at um, St. Joseph Prep. The next, um, so the next pillar of our educational model is authentic community. So St. Joseph Prep is an inclusive community. It's one where students push, push, push each other to be their best selves. Um, we provide a holistic academic experience that really seeks to educate the students mind, body, and soul. We spoke a bit about this previously, but our advisory program is another way that we also foster that authentic engagement and community here. Um, advisory offers, again, that one-on-one -on -one coaching, and it meets every day. And the student's advisor also follows them through their four years at St. Joseph Prep, which allows for mentorship, support, and academic accountability too. At SJP, our students are, we say known and loved, and our students tell us that SJP and our community feels like a second home to them. The third pillar is meaningful engagement. Um, so um, we offer an extensive variety of clubs and organizations, um, and we really expect students to be engaged in our community. Most students take the opportunity to engage in extracurricular op opportunities here. And we offer a lot of opportunities within the areas of the visual arts, performing arts. We also have academic clubs, service clubs, campus ministry, student government, um, and even more. We also offer athletics too. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, we also offer athletics. So we're the Phoenix and we take pride in that. Um, most of our sports teams have what's called a no cut policy. So students who want to play a sport at St. Joseph Prep are able to. And despite that no cut policy, we're still able to be competitive in athletics too. Um, this year, for example, girls volleyball is a really great example of that no cut policy. So this year we had about, I think it was 40 girls come out for the girls volleyball team. And in a traditional high school, you know, a lot of times you'll just have a varsity and a JV team. And if you don't make the varsity or JV, you're kind of out of luck and not able to play. But at St. Joseph Prep, this year we had the varsity team, the JV, and then we also had kind of a development team. So to help those students who are interested in playing volleyball, uh, but maybe have never played before, be able to still participate in that sport and get that experience so that maybe next year they'll make the JV or varsity team. So that's one thing that I always love to mention when talking about athletics at SJP is that no cut policy and students that want to play a sport are able to do so on our campus. 
Then the final pillar um, of our academic model at SJP is dynamic innovation. So we talked about this a little bit before, but our STEAM curriculum offers high level insights into those related fields. We also have an engineering certificate program for those students who may be interested. We also have a laptop program. So every student uses a MacBook in assistance of their academics. During COVID, um, we were actually a local leader in remote education. Every student received that live instruction, either in person or remotely from their teachers every single day. All right, I think that's all for me. I'll pass it over to Scott now to talk a little bit more about the support services that we offer for students at SJP. Great, great. Um, thank you, Abby. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. And it's always great to come visit Carol. You know, it's actually something I look forward to every year. So we're doing this virtually again this year for the second time in a row. Um, but maybe I'll get a chance to meet some of um, you in person at our open house. Um, I, we have a great history um, of Carol students um, being really successful at SJP. You know, typically, you know, we have about 15 Carol students um, walking the halls of our school on, on a given year from freshman to senior year. So it's not, you know, it's not a, a ton of students, but those, those students that we do have have done incredibly well here. And I'll talk a little bit about um, outcomes, but I think the best place to start because a lot of parent questions that I've had um, over the years are about our academic, academic enrichment center. And, you know, I was introduced as the assistant head of school, but I'm also the director of the Academic Enrichment Center. I'm also a learning specialist. Um, I, I created this program um, for students eight years ago, and we've had incredible success for students um, with learning differences um, going off to great colleges. And I have a special education background myself. I, I worked as a middle school head at the Springer School in Cincinnati, um, Ohio, which is a school very much like Carroll. It's an LD. Um, day school for students with language-based learning differences. So um, I have a I have the background, um, you know, that you know um, to help support students and get them off on the right track. So um, we have a great team here. We have another learning specialist, Mr. Genitelli. We have a number of different tutors um, that come and work here for us in the writing center and the math and science labs as well. Um, so. Those are all great within the AEC, but generally what we're really known for is our office hours after school. So, you know, academic support at St. Joseph Prep really starts with the teachers just being available. You know, you can have great academic support program, but if you don't have um, the faculty all on board, then, you know, it's really going to be a difficult um, struggle for a, a freshman student coming in. So, uh, one thing that's awesome, uh, you know, open door policy, all of our teachers are here after school. Um, if you were here, you know, yesterday at 245, you probably would have seen two or three students in each teacher's classroom um, just going to get extra help. And these are kids that maybe have B's in classes that are trying to get an A. So um, teacher office hours, something we encourage. And we want our students to graduate and go to college and do that when they get to the college level. So we've kind of modeled that um, after what we see successful college students do. So every student has access to those office hours. Every student has an academic advisor, which Abby spoke uh, about to provide you know, academic coaching and some, some support around setting goals. And then we also have more structured programs for students after school. Um, if they're not going office hours on their own, then we put plans together um, to, to encourage them to do so and track their attendance and those kinds of things. So sometimes students, even, even some of our great advocates from the Carroll School need, need a little extra support and structure. Um, so on, in addition to that, um, Abby, I'm going to have you go on to the next slide. She's, she's kind of the slide queen this morning. Thanks. Um, we have additional services within the Academic Enrichment Center that all students have access to. Um, so one thing about our school that you know, I found that sets us apart from other schools I've been, I've been a part of is that we really don't have stigma when it comes to um, students with learning differences receiving extra support 
uh, whether it's executive function help, whether it's reading comprehension strategies. Um, we have other students that are also coming in to, to receive it, uh, extra support that don't have learning differences. So it's it's something that's open to everyone. You know, that, that doesn't mean that your student with a neuropsych or an IEP is not gonna get the uh, appropriate amount of time that they deserve. It just means that uh, you know, there's just a feeling when you come to our school and our academic enrichment center that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of all inclusive and it's part of um, the mission of our school. So on a given year, we have about 35 or 40 percent of our students are um, participating in some academic enrichment center offering some academic support program and about 15 percent of the kids at our school um, have a learning difference. So it's nice for students to see other students um, outside of the academic enrichment center that are also going to get math help or working with a writing tutor. Um, so within that structure, uh, we have a math enrichment tutor who's here three days a week, works with kids one-on-one -on -one, um, or, or two-on-one uh, typically throughout the day. So he, you know, he's been working with probably 35 or 40 students uh, and just helps them um, in terms of preparing for quizzes and tests. We really try to take a proactive approach there. Uh, we also have a writing tutor that's available that comes in. Uh, we've had Boston College grad students that come support our students on a regular basis um, and are available as well. And then you have myself, we also have the full-time learning specialist, Mr. Janatelli, who really works with um, the students in the Academic Enrichment Center. And I think, you know, there are specific services just for students that have learning differences, which, which is what I'm going to get to at this point. Um, if Abby, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So if you do have a learning difference, you know, um, really, this is where I think most of the Carroll family's ears perk up a little bit um, in this presentation. Uh, you know, we support you from the beginning based on the creation of an academic enrichment center learning plan. So that learning plan is really a strength based accommodations plan um, for your student that we work on throughout the summer of the, the eighth grade and we present that to parents at the beginning of the school year and to students. We have individual meetings um, right around the first week or two of school. Teachers have all received the accommodations plan. They're in the loop. Uh, you know, if students need extended time or preferential seating, copies of notes, like th that's all provided and that's all um, something that our faculty are in the loop on from, the, from day one in the school year. So. Um, that process of having a learning plan, we really try to be inclusive uh, and have the student participate in understanding why, what their strengths are as a learner, uh, what areas they struggle in, and why they might need accommodations, and, and how to you know, really advocate for those accommodations. So typically, our Carroll students do a phenomenal job of coming in as advocates. They've been well-trained. Uh, by the team there. And, but it's always nice to have, you know, a staff here that is kind of looped in and connected with, with the Carroll strategies and, and Carroll's philosophy. So uh, we have um, had so many great um, successful Carroll students come through, but sometimes they come to high school and they, they kind of forget everything that they've been taught over there. CC's probably uh, like, you know, shocked that I'm saying that, but they, I think sometimes kids think, okay, well, I'm in high school now. I'm, you know, just going to hit the restart button. And uh, I, they just need a little reminder here and there uh, from our team here, like, hey, you have a organizational plan um, that worked for you when you were in eighth grade. Like, let's go with that. You know, you've learned some great note-taking strategies um, in eighth grade. So now you're in ninth grade, like, Let's not throw all that out the window. So um, part of what we do um, a really good job of here is just transitioning students, uh, whether they're from the Carroll School or not, um, just to our ninth grade, um, just based on the connection and understanding of, of the program there. Um, but within that, um, our AEC, our Academic Enrichment Center, students will come um, to our study, which is a more structured, smaller study hall. 
and probably three to five kids um, in each study hall. And they would, they would have a learning, the learning specialist, Mr. Genitelli or myself, uh, working with them and setting goals for the period, talking about what tests and quizzes are coming up, helping them study uh, for those tests and quizzes, working through um, proactive strategies that they might need in terms of, you know, reading, um, or if there's something going on um, in a class and they need support from the teacher after school, you know, we, we can encourage them to work with the teacher. Um, so, so all of that's kind of baked into the study hall and, you know, we don't have really an issue around stigma here, but we also uh, like to give our kids like a home, you know, you know, if you have a learning difference, sometimes it's nice to be um, connected to other students that also have accommodations and extended time. So they almost have like an additional um, advisor or an additional like micro community in a way. So, uh, you know, Abby talked about how she's an advisor to a group um, of juniors. So, you know, if your students were coming in as ninth graders next year or maybe the year after that, they would have an academic advisor, but they'd also have a learning specialist here that acts as like a second academic advisor and mentor um, for them. And they get to know some of the kids um, in the academic enrichment center as well. Um, so in terms of outcomes for our Carroll students, you know, we had some great data um, that we had mined over the years. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, Abby, that'd be awesome. Where you know, for a number of years there, you know, we had kids coming in with a 3.3 um, GPA their freshman year coming from the Carroll School. I wasn't able to kind of dig around and, and take the Carroll School GPAs and, and come up with that number um, based on last year's um, students that are now sophomores, but typically um, the students that come from the Carroll School are, you know, they're students that are hardworking, that want to do well, they want to participate um, in all of our great extracurriculars, they want to play sports, you know, some are very competitive, um, some of our best athletes have come from the Carroll School, and others are students that maybe they want to try golf for the first time, or they want to try, or they want to play on the soccer team, um, and as Abby said, there, um, we, we have a no-cut policy for um, the majority of our of our JV and varsity sports, um, but our but our students generally from the Carroll School are getting A's and B's their freshman year, and you know just coming into this small community that we have at St. Joseph Prep, it just feels like the Carroll School in a way. If you ask students, um, which you can at open house, you know we'll we'll make sure you meet some uh, Carroll grads, but it's a it's just a perfect step up from. Um, some of the same experiences that they've had in Carroll. They find the same loving community. They find the same um, really kind and genuine teachers that want, uh, want them to be successful, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as well. Um, so I think all this kind of leads to a recipe for success in college. And um, that's something we do uh, and a great job here, our team. Um, our learning specialists also work with our college and school counselors um, to make sure that students are getting the extended time they need for the college board tests like, you know, PSAT, um, SAT, or the ACT, and also to make sure that those accommodations follow students um, to the college level and that they're matched up with um, a school where they will, they will find success um, at the university level. Um, so with that said, um, I'm sure there's going to be a thousand questions of, uh, about different accommodations that we offer and that kind of thing, and, and we're happy to answer those um, toward, at the end of this presentation, but I'm going to pass it over to um, Emily, who's going to talk a little bit more about the application process. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, so yes, the application process. So on the next um, couple of slides, we're going to kind of show you um, what it is that we're requiring of students as they do make application to St. Joseph Prep. So first off, we're, we're looking for the HSPT, which in fact, uh, we have several students um, past few weekends taking the prep course here. And of course, we have the exam coming up scheduled on November 6th. So um, I believe there's still time to register if you haven't yet registered um, your student for the test, if you are looking to do so. 
Um, but we also are accepting the SSAT. Um, <clears throat> Scott talked a little bit about accommodations um, when, it, when it comes to what we can offer students in our um, academic enrichment center. But um, certainly with the, um, when it comes to an accommodation for the HSPT, um, really it's the extended um, time that we're able to offer students. Um, and that would be um, offered to students um, once we actually are able to get the, um, the 504 plan or IEP um, information from the family. So that would be something that you'd wanna send here prior to the test, just a little side note on that. So as we move to the next slide, this is going to show you um, over the past few years for the classes that are, are um, graduated in um, 19 and 20 and um, 21, and then upcoming 22 and 23, kind of the span of what the HSPT scores have looked like for students. So as you can see, they kind of <clears throat> are falling into different um, quartiles for sure. Um, this certainly is not the only element of the application that we are focusing on in order to make an admissions decision. So as we move to the next slide, you'll see kind of the remaining pieces that, that we are going to look at. So that would entail um, certainly application in, in Ravenna. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with that um, intimately already at this point. Um, the release of records for the student, which would include the transcript um, for the last couple of years, um, attendance and also discipline record, um, and any other kind of complimentary um, supplemental information that would be helpful to us in the application process to make the best decision for the student. Um, the school report form, which is um, certainly something that either the principal or, or someone in the guidance office can fill out um, for your student. And certainly a recommendation in, from the um, math and English teachers. Um, these will certainly give us an opportunity to get a sense of, of how the student has performed um, in, in those classes and, and we give us a sense as how they might continue to perform um, and be able to perform in our class setting. And again, all of this taken together is looked at in a very holistic fashion. Um, so that again, it comes down to really wanting to make the best decision for your students so that we know that we can um, accommodate them. Um, and I, I don't use that word to say, speak to students with accommodations necessarily, but just make sure that this is a proper academic setting um, for your student because nobody wants it to not be, that's for sure. The student, us, you, everybody, so. Um, as we move to the next slide, I um, just want to talk about um, everybody's favorite topic, <laughs> financial aid. Um, we are using the FACTS for financial aid, F-A-C-T-S. Um, the application for that really should be um, coming in complete by December 31st. And um, at the get-go, we are using um, this year um, <clears throat> 2020 W-2s and tax returns. Um, and that's so that we can kind of work off on an estimated, estimated package for you. Um, and then later on, um, once you get your 2021 um, tax information, the um, um, more of a finalized decision can come out for you for financial aid. So a preliminary award would be done for you if you have everything in and it's completed again by December 31st, we'd be able to get a preliminary award out to you um, around the time of admissions decisions, February 3rd. Um, so the decision and ideally the aid package would come as well. And then more towards April would be uh, the finalized package with the 2021 information having been received by us. Um, moving on. We, um, this is kind of a nice slide in terms of giving you kind of a very quick snapshot of kind of what things are looking like in our enrollment funnel, as we like to call it, because um, of course everybody starts up at the top with as being kind of an inquiry and then they apply, get accepted and ideally enroll. So um, we kind of start typically with about a couple hundred applications um, with the acceptance rate right around 60 to 65%. Um, the aim for this coming year is to enroll about 65 students. And um, as we kind of look at the list of feeder schools that we have, um, certainly Carol um, is, is one of those. We have about 35. 
Um, and there's a nice split of students coming from really directly from the Boston metro area and then um, outside of Boston as well. So um, if you're coming to the open house this weekend, we will have a, a transportation table, which you might say, you know, what, what's, what does that mean? Um, so that is a table that actually will address you know, how, how your, your child can get here. What are the different ways? Um, how are some of our students getting here? We're actually gonna have some students at the table to talk about their commutes. And we have a nice big map showing from where all of our students are coming in. So each and every one pretty, pretty much has a different commute to get here. So, um, but as Abby said, right at the get-go of this presentation, we are very accessible by public transportation, which is great. Um, we have, which is kind of a really nice fact, um, and I think says a lot about the school, is about 10 to 20 siblings in each class. Um, so if, if one starts here, that, that must mean that it's, it's, been a good, it's been a good ride and that, you know, another one is going to come along shortly thereafter. And then um, in terms of um, students with learning differences, about 10 to 15 percent of the student population um, would fall into um, having such a difference. And then I think we are, um, yeah, on the timeline slide. So you've heard me mention the open house. We have some student visit days upcoming. Um, we have a priority application deadline of December 15th. So if you don't happen to get it all wrapped up by then, um, we can certainly entertain applications after that date. Um, as I mentioned earlier, looking for you to get all of your documents in um, by the 31st of December in order to be able to get you a financial aid package um, when the decisions are released in February. And then March 16th would be the date that you'd want to aim for, um, for your deposit. So I think that brings us to a close and definitely want to open up the floor for questions. Um, I know a couple came through the chat and I, and I, as I recall, um, those are nice juicy ones for Scott. Um, I, I didn't mention actually, Abby and I are, are relatively new to SJP. So um, we are learning with you and um, we are still sponges soaking everything in. So certainly listening to Scott's words is um, are very yeah, helpful yeah. To, to Abby. I'll and take, yeah, I'll start with uh, the questions in the chat. And then if you have a question um, that you want to just ask out loud, maybe Abby can uh, moderate that. But just with a couple chat questions we had, uh, can we ad please address the transition of 10th graders coming from the Carroll Upper School Program? So we've had a few um, Carroll students come from the Upper School Program that have been really successful. Uh, a couple of those have transitioned right into the 10th grade here at St. Joseph Prep. And then we've also had a couple students actually repeat nine um, and come from the upper school and then take another, uh, just enter into our ninth grade program. So it's all um, dependent on what Carol recommends, uh, what the families decide to do. Um, but we do, we do have a number of kids typically um, transition into our school uh, if they're a great fit from, from other high schools as well into the 10th grade. Um, not typically into the um, upper grades as often, but we usually have a few kids come into the 10th grade. We have a few international students and we run a, uh, in the summer, we run a transition program, uh, which is a day or two for our students that are, that are brand new to the community. We match them up uh, with some, some current students. So they have kind of a um, stu student buddies from the beginning of the year. And, you know, we, we make sure that they are successful um, from, from day one in terms of just getting, you know, making sure that they have a great advisor, you know, checking the learning specialist, myself, checking in with them, uh, making sure they're connected and that they're um, getting involved in the community. Typically, if there's a sport or an activity, um, it's great for a student that is a transfer student to get involved and make friends from the beginning of the school year. Um, our sports start a couple weeks before um, the first day of school, so they get to know other students right away. Um, so we get, so we make sure they don't fall through the cracks. And uh, in terms of the curriculum and, and pairing them up with the courses that we have here, we haven't had any um, challenges with that. So I hope that answers that question. So how frequent are the supervised study halls? So uh, we do have students that take a um, language deferral here and some students that take a language waiver. So it depends on if you wanna take Spanish or Latin, 
um, as a freshman, or if you um, if you don't, if you take a deferral, we have kids that will start foreign language um, in 10th grade. And there's typically a number of our Carroll students that will take the language deferral. And even though they're eligible for a waiver, a lot of the students with uh, dyslexia or language-based learning difference will actually um, not take the foreign language until their 10th grade and they'll take it 10th and 11th um, or even 10th, 11th, 12th, just so that they have that um, on their transcript for college applications. But um, if, you don't, if you do start with a foreign language, you typically would have three or four study halls per week uh, where you would meet with a learning specialist in the Academic Enrichment Center. If you defer foreign language or you take a, lay, a waiver, then that frees up even more time for you in the Academic Enrichment Center to work um, with the learning specialist, structured environment, um, and work on executive function skills and uh, just make sure that you have as much work as you can done before um, the end of, end of the day. So we've had a lot of success um, there also, but it just depends on the on what the students' goals are and what the families um, are looking for. Um, so let's see, it looks like Mary asked a good question. A typical day, length of classes, free periods. I talked about the language already, but a typical day um, for our students is for them to go through five class periods. Um, all of our freshmen um, take seven classes and they have a study hall and we're on a rotating schedule. Um, and I think, you know, we can pop this up on our website or if you're at the open house, um, you can see what it looks like. But essentially, um, our class periods are 65 minutes in length, so they're not a, they're not like true blocks, true block schedule, but um, there's enough time in there where our freshman teachers might take a middle, um, take a little break in the middle of um, the class period, but there, it's also lengthy enough for, for real instruction to happen in terms of what the class looks like. You're going to see not a lot of teacher led instruction. You know, I think, I think, I think a lot of families very concerned about high school because they think, okay, my student's gonna be lectured to for 65 minutes. Um, but that's really not what best practice is at our school. Really, you know, not to promote all the other school options that you have, but they probably aren't doing that either. So like that might quell some fears out there. Um, but student-centered learning is something we do at St. Joseph Prep and you'd find in most high schools uh, we do it really well here. We have a lot of students that I actually have a student at my door right now. Give me one second. Give me one second. I'm just going to I'm just going to um, tell them I'm on a presentation. Thanks, Scott. While Scott's doing that, we yeah. can actually Ayana had a great question. Um, can applicants take the HSPT at a different school or test site? Sorry, Scott, I was just jumping to answer a question while you're gone. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. That's a really quick and easy one. Um, yes, students, applicants can take the HSPT at a different school or test site if that's easier. Um, when you take the HSPT, you can send your score to up to five different schools. So if you're taking it at a different school, just make sure to send it to SJP. But yeah, that's no problem at all. All right, back to you, Scott. I'll just be brief to wrap it up. But with the 65 minute period, you know, you're going to see students working in groups. Um, there is some lecture, you know, but you're going to see students doing some classwork assignments with teachers guiding them. Uh, we do have strategies that we also teach all of our freshmen and those are um, baked into our, into our curriculum. So it's not just all content. So you're also going to see some similar type of instruction that you've seen at the Carroll School where you know, a teacher's teaching students how to take notes or how to read a textbook. And, you know, those are all good things for, for all freshmen coming from all different schools um, to learn. So that, that's really part of what we're all about. But by having five classes, most kids will have maybe three homework assignments um, to do, and they can get maybe one or two of those done um, during their study halls, and they can either go see a teacher after school to get extra help on that last one or two um, assignment, or they go off to soccer practice, and then they go home, and they have maybe an hour um, or an hour and a half left of homework to do um, at home. So it's so it's not at, you know, we're not, we do have probably two 
um, two and a half hours of homework, but a lot of that can get done at school here with our teachers, with our learning specialist team. Um, so it's not just a mountain of homework um, for someone to try to meander on their own. And by having five class periods a day, um, it's actually, we found our students that struggle with executive function uh, are much more successful because they're not having to prioritize and balance, um, you know, six different assignments to do each night. So they'll have three or four to do. And every teacher has a Google Classroom. Um, some of the EF tools that we use are just kind of baked into the school um, for everyone. Um, so I don't know, Abby, do you want to see if there's any questions that anyone wants to ask? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Scott. I was going to say these the are chat, I'm not sure. These are great questions. So there are no new questions in the chat, but does anyone have any other questions? Feel free to just come off mute. Or if you feel more comfortable putting it in the chat, I have the chat up. So feel free to do that. Oh, Megan, it looks like Megan raised her hand. Yeah, Megan, go ahead. I think you're muted, Megan. Sorry. Um, yeah. I love the uh, like, uh, kind of religious uh, history and orientation and all of that. Um, but if a child isn't Christian, what has their experience been like uh, typically at SJP? Yeah, great question. You know, our students come from all different faith backgrounds. We have a lot of students that come here that, that aren't Christian, that aren't Catholic, and they all take theology. So we do have four years of theology and, you know, learning about the Bible and learning about scripture is kind of the basis for, for that curriculum. Um, so the first year they do get into biblical stories and, and not everyone's on the same page. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to act like it's, you know, some kids come in and they know all these things and others don't, but we really start at, um, you know, ground zero for everyone. So if you're someone that is Catholic or Christian, you come in and it's a super easy class, you know, and if you're not, then it's still not heavy lifting in terms of like the coursework or the homework or the assignments um, as a freshman, but you, you just need some of that background to, to better understand the concepts that come later on in, in that curriculum. When we get to like junior and senior year, um, it's, re it's all really based on social justice, um, diversity, inclusion, and, you know, less on, less on the actual content. And, but that content knowledge like helps form some discussions that you have later. So I would say, you know, it's always something new for probably half the kids, probably half the kids in each theology class are, um, hearing some, some of these Bible stories for the first time, but we're not, we're not out to, um, draw you to the faith like you know if you're if that's not something that you're interested in and just a part of um, our mission at our school is to um, serve the dear neighbor serve all students of all faiths and we do have chapel um, but chapel is essentially students that um, get up and they give it give a like personal anecdote tell a, tell a personal story about themselves um, and that's something that they do at each grade level. Um, so when you hear like chapel about chapel, St. Joseph prep, you know, there's, there's just different ways that, um, faith is integrated into our school, but it's not something that you're going to find like every element of, uh, in each class. You know, we want to make sure that, um, students that aren't Christian are also really comfortable and at all times. So. I think that helps. I always get asked, like, do they have theology every four for four years? And like, I think some parents like want to hear no, <laughs> you know, I'm like, we do have four years of theology, but it's actually awesome. Um, leads to students doing, you know, a lot of this social justice work, then they do a senior service project um, as a senior, and they get out and they serve the community. So uh, it's, it's not always about faith, you know, it's about serving the dear neighbor. Yeah. I just wanted to add, Scott, to something that you said um, with the Chapel Speak program, which I, I think is a really great piece of, of the students' time here is, um, one, it, it really additionally helps them kind of in the category of public speaking. Um, so I think that that's such a nice element, too. And then second, secondly, um, 
you you noted that it is kind of a, a a speech about themselves. So it does help kind of build build the community sense that he yeah. is here at SJP. Because um, again, it's the the students are known and loved, and 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 part of what they're they're sharing about themselves allows the other students to get to know them, and vice versa. So um, there's there's even greater, I think, dividends that are paid from the students taking part in, in that piece of um, their time here at SJP. Awesome, thanks, Emily. Um, Ayana raised her hand. Go ahead, Ayana. Hi, thank you. So, um, Scott, you mentioned that um, the sort of theology curriculum turns into sort of a social justice, equity and inclusion curriculum as um, students get older. And I just wondered, um, you know, is there space in the community for um, LGBTQ kids, for kids that maybe have non-binary gender identification, just what that looks like at SJP? Yeah, so definitely we have students now, um, LGBTQ students, and we always have, you know, I think the Sisters of St. Joseph who sponsored the school, uh, there were, you know, in terms of Catholicism, you know, I'd say that they're they're relatively open and uh, I would say that um, if you do a little research or you dig around on their Instagram I think you'd find the same thing so we we do have a number of kids right now um, that are that do identify um, or you know by are non-binary so it just depends on if the you know so, you know getting you know sometimes it's up to the parent um, to give consent in terms of you know if we're gonna um, speak to a student by they them or or you know or or basically what what the parent and the student agree upon they just let us know when they come into the community um, but you'd find a, you'd find our school to be um, very open um, for for all students yeah thanks Scott um, I actually got a direct message um, so the question is many of our kids excel in science and math and I'm curious Curious about opportunities for students in science and math at SJP. Do you want me to take that one? I can, yeah, I can keep going. Not. Okay, so. Thank you. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a double math option for our um, sophomore students. So a lot of kids will come in, um, especially kids from the Carroll School will come in and take Algebra 1 or Algebra 1 honors. I think a lot of times they get recommended um, to take geometry um, right away, but sometimes we have them um, just firm up some of those foundational concepts in algebra because it can really help them be successful in, in pre-calc and calculus later. Um, but we we have had some Carroll students come in to the freshman class and take um, geometry honors. Um, but we have double math you can take as a sophomore. So you can cut, you can you can skip a year of, of world history if you're more of a science math brain and that's the pursuit you want to take. And you can take algebra two honors and geometry honors as a sophomore, which allows you to take a um, AP calculus or an AP stats course later on um, as a as a senior. So um, that's one one thing that we do offer. I think. This just being a STEAM school in general, um, we are not, you know, a lot, I think a lot of Catholic schools are really like humanities based um, curriculum. And I would say that we, we do have some classical elements of like what a independent Catholic school might be in terms of the humanities. You know, we do have a double English class for freshmen, um, English writing and English literature. But I would actually um, describe our school more as a STEAM school that that is more geared for students that uh, um, are looking to get into engineering, um, architecture. You know, we have a we have a really great program, computer science class that we just added for freshmen um, to take. We have an AP computer science program here, um, along with the STEAM course that they take freshman and sophomore year. They can also take. Um, a lot of our students and a lot of our Carroll students that were like fab lab fanatics, you know, like they'll take uh, um, CAD courses here and go off to um, architecture programs and engineering programs when they graduate. Uh, and so I, I would say that we do kind of, I think it's maybe it's just society, but I think it's like where we are trying to prepare our students for an ever changing uh, world where really under, knowing technology and, and having a, 
a strong basis in engineering and, and math is really important these days. So we do offer um, those programs for students here. Awesome, thank you so much, Scott. Um, anyone else have any other questions? And if you don't I have a question, to... Abigail, if that's okay. Uh, wondering, can you talk a little bit more about the student who might not be interested in the athletics, but more in the arts program and what you have to offer? And also, in addition, a student who uh, we had a wonderful visit recently and had a fabulous tour by a Carol student, and she was discussing about all these amazing clubs that she was part of. And I see the clubs also take place at the same time as the athletics. And she's very involved. And I just want to hear how a student can be involved in the community in different capacities. Yeah, that's a great question. OK, I'll take <laughs> that. <laughs> I've been here for so long. You know, I'm like, I can handle any questions anyone has. Um, but I know Abby or Emily could answer that one. But I would say um, in terms of the arts, you know, we have we do have a lot of kids that want to come in and they, that, you know, they aspire to take like an AP um, studio art course. We have a great art club. There's kids down in the art room um, every day if they're interested in visual arts, but we also have um, a lot of kids that are involved in our Phoenix players, you know, which is our um, theater and musical program and um, two super energetic, like fun um, teachers. And one's the actually the director of our STEAM programs that run our theater program. And um, Dr. Borkowski, who's our um, biology teacher that all the freshmen love and get to know, he also um, kind of helps lead that, the theater and the production. So if, if you're someone that's interested in that side of arts, uh, we have a great program for you. Um, they are also, and, you know, they're almost like, uh, it is like it's being on a sports team because, um, they're here after school and they still go to teacher's office hours. And then they have, um, either theater practice or play practice, like starting at three 30. Uh, so they still have time to check in with teachers. But, um, I would say that we run, um, kind of a steam focused, uh, visual arts program, which, which I think offers kids that are more interested in like graphic design elements to also, um, showcase some of their skills and talents. So we have a, a steam show every year. So if you're someone that's into visual arts, we'll present, um, your work on display, like for the whole community, um, at kind of like an arts night, uh, where all the parents and students come. But if you're someone that's really interested in like CAD, or maybe you did like, maybe you, maybe you did a great design, like a great floor plan for a, uh, for Fenway Park or something like that, then uh, we'll put that on display and you can showcase that. So it just depends on um, who you are as an individual. And in terms of clubs, I mean, I think uh, we have probably over 15 clubs right now. And anytime any student wants to start a club, um, they can do so, and our clubs typically run um, after school, also after office hours, um, so 3.15 or 3.30. Uh, right now, you know, we have, we have a video game club. I mean, we have a video game club. I mean, that maybe that scares a few parents because they're like, oh, my son plays enough video games, but it gives kids an opportunity to connect with each other, but we have uh, clubs from student government, you know, that would be more like uh, something that might be really great on your college transcript, like, you know, from student government all the way down to like kids that come and are in a knitting club and, or a creative writing club or something that they just want to connect um, with other students. We also have a mental health awareness club uh, right now that is uh, really has a, a real po really popular with our student body. Uh, I think over 35 or 40 students are in there. And, you know, they do, they, they teach meditation strategies and things like that to the, the community here. So um, it's really anything you want to get involved in, uh, we have. I would say um, in terms of like clubs that we don't have, like, you know, we've had, we've had students come and just start a club and get four or five people together and a faculty moderator so that we're always open to starting new clubs also. Yeah, that's a good point, Scott. I know this year the cheer club was started. One of my advisees actually started a cheer club 
Um, so she has a faculty advisor and a bunch of a bunch of students that signed up. So it is very, very easy to start a club. Um, and it's really easier to be involved in a lot of different clubs too, because not every club meets every day. Um, and a lot of times too, you know, if a student has to miss a meeting for maybe a, a sports game or something like that, it's very easy to, you know, just join the next week. Um, so it's a, I'd say very low key, you know, if you, if you make the club meeting, great. Um, if you miss one due to another commitment, I think that's okay too. Awesome. Well, I know we have about three minutes left. Oh, it looks like Lindsay just raised her hand. Lindsay, go ahead. Thank you for this presentation. It's been so helpful. Um, I have to ask, not the most important question, but how do kids deal with the transition to uniforms from an environment that was really casual, anything goes? Yeah. How does yeah. that go? <laughs> um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty light. In terms of the uniform these days, we do have a uniform, but we start with a polo, um, St. Joseph Prep polo for most of the fall. And, you know, we do have days where kids wear a blazer and a tie and, and those are pretty rare. Um, okay. you, know, that's, you know, if we're going to have a special event or something like that. So I think a lot of the Carroll School students, I mean, I hate to like keep saying using, I'm just trying to use my historical knowledge here, but most are like, well, I want to wear shorts or, you know, I don't want to wear a polo. You know, it's usually they come in and they're okay. Just getting used to wearing a polo. They wear khakis and like Sperry's or like leather sneakers. And they see everyone else also wearing the uniform and it kind of unites everyone, you know, like there's still opportunity for some individual flair. Um, but it, it, you know, we have kids coming from so many different socioeconomical backgrounds that um, by having the uniform, it kind of puts everyone on the same playing field, gives everyone an opportunity um, to be one together. And I think that's why we, we've continued to go with the uniform. But if you come and you walk around, you know, open house, you might see some um, may, maybe fancier dress um, students with blazers. Um, but like on a general day, we have kids wearing like fleece quarter zips with St. Joseph prep and khakis. Uh, most, most kids can handle, can handle Perfect. that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Scott. Yes, you're right. They'll be looking very sharp on open house day. Um, Mary. Yes. Um, we'd love to have you ask a question quick. If you'd like. Oh, quick. Sorry. I don't know how to raise my hand on the thing. <laughs> I'm not that savvy with that, but, um, Thank you all so much for the insight. It's really, really helpful. My last question or my question is, um, I know you have a visiting student day. Can you just tell me about that? Like, is it all day? Is it for an hour? Like how, and, and I would assume I can kind of gather what that's like, but I, I love that you offer that because a lot of schools don't offer that. And how, tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Emily, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so Mary, we, we definitely are actually still in the stages of building it. There's been such a heavy focus on the open house. So I, I apologize. I don't have a lot of details to share with you, but um, I think it would be available to a limited number of students. Um, I kind of want to check back on, in terms of what we've done in the past. Um, I know with COVID, we're, we're trying to be kind of sensitive about um, you know, social distancing um, and, and um, making sure that everybody's safe in the process of doing this. But um, ideally, and kind of, I think in a nutshell, it would be giving your student the opportunity to spend part of a day here kind of shadowing a current student, um, and then maybe hearing a little bit from um, admissions about the admissions process and maybe some of the administration about, you know, some of the different elements that are available to them here as a student. Um, but as of yet, we don't have um, an agenda per, um, per se that we could share, but but we are going to be working on that as soon as we can. <laughs> with open okay. Okay, so it's kind of the way Emily described in the past, you know, they come through um, a few classes. It's like a half day, right. not a full school day. Uh, we've had full school day. We've had different versions, different years, depending on like who's interested and what they want to, what they want to see. Yeah. Cause most times they offer it after you've been accepted, like later in the year to see if that's, you know, I just never seen it that way, but I, I like it because you can really get a taste of what the day is like. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks Mary. 
Awesome. Does anyone have, I know we're over time, um, but does anyone have a last minute question? All right. I don't know, Emily, do you want to close this off or? Uh, well, I just want to thank everybody for attending. I know um, several had to jump off, um, but I do, do want to thank um, CC and Charlene for, for asking us to be with you all today. And we are certainly available um, for any follow-up questions that might occur to you afterward. Because um, I know that for me, that is usually when the questions <laughs> come up is after, after the fact. So I'm happy to continue to work with you and hopefully we'll see some of you this coming Sunday or at some of the upcoming events that we're doing. And um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you Thank so you much. very much on behalf of Carroll School and our Secondary School Advising Office. Thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thanks everyone.